Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Matt Bemis and today I will be um, chatting about studying pedestrian wind comfort uh, in Boston, um, Massachusetts. Um, so just to, to begin a little background about myself, um, I've been running simulations on a daily basis for about four years now. Um, I've worked for a few um, CFD providers and I've done support and consulting and uh, you know really really enjoy computer-aided engineering so just a bit of uh, housekeeping first the agenda today will basically um, chat about the benefits of, of using simulation we'll do a bit of an introduction in, into sim scale and then we'll dive into today's com um, topic which is pedestrian wing comfort I'm going to do a bit of a live demo and, and kind of step you through my t test case and then we'll do a, a, a result summary and, and some major takeaways from the uh, from the case uh, study, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So first, I just, uh, we probably have a mixed audience, so I want to touch a little bit on the, the benefits of using simulation. Um, so one of the main benefits of, of using simulation is, is really, you know, getting your first prototype or your first test correct. Um, or, you know, you want to be in the right ballpark uh, by the time you're, you're ready to, to start testing something. Um, and really, you can you know digitally prototype on you know on the computer. You can make design changes and, and start to understand how the performance of of your product or design will change based on that. Um, and you can do this at a faster rate than you could ever physically prototype. So it, it allows you to consider more design options or more design changes, and and land on a better product in in the same amount of time. Um, Right, so everyone knows it stinks to you know have a bunch of different prototypes you have to test. Uh, getting prototypes manufactured is pain, uh, you know, takes some time. Uh, getting them shipped to you, set up on a, on a test rig with you know whether you're using thermocouples or or you know uh, pressure taps, all that takes time and, and there's overhead there. So if you only have to do one one test, um, that's that's you know the ideal prototype basically. Um, you know. And um, you really want to just try to minimize, you know, failure. You don't if um, if you get everything wrong, really, uh, on your prototype one, that just is delays in, until you get another one. So, um, you know, just reduce time investment, minimize your failures, and overall, just bring costs down. So, a little bit of the benefits, uh, you know, using simulation for AEC. Um, poor performance in AEC can cause massive issues and massive problems because there's so many parties involved you know with an AEC model you don't get you know the the luxury of, of doing a physical prototype usually the the first one you make is, is the you know real life one that's that's the final design and if things start to go bad you can hurt your reputation uh, you know kind of hurt the brand name of who you're working for and you you know retrofitting will have to be done and it's very very expensive um, you know Sim scale can provide a, a whole array of, of uh, uh, you know, solutions to questions an AEC engineer might be facing, whether that's, uh, you know, pedestrian wind comfort, like what we'll get today, or thermal comfort inside, you know, uh, in auditorium, or, or looking at, you know, um, natural uh, ventilation in a building, things like that. Um, it can also help improve energy efficiency. So the big one that sticks out to me, I used to do a lot of work in the data center field, and, you know, I've walked into data centers and the room is 60 degrees because uh, the facilities manager, you know, wants to keep the thermostat extremely cold when in real life you can you know, maybe crank that up to, say, 70, 75. Um, if, if all it takes to save it an enormous amount of electricity is just turn the, the air conditioning thermostat up, that's, that's a very easy solution. But you can evaluate performance before you make that change so you can have confidence uh, that things won't go wrong. Um, now, when it comes to control, uh, controlling air quality and contamination, uh, you know, we, we uh, offer solutions so that someone designing um, a clean room, maybe for their chip manufacturing or, or an operating room um, a, for a medical application, um, you know, an engineer can understand the, the performance of that room. Will there be recirculation? Will there be turbulent air? And, and you know, um, could that affect the, the performance of, of the room? And, you know, if you want to make a design change, what are the impl uh, implications there? 
So a little bit of background and just introduction to, to SimScale. So it's a fully cloud-based, browser-based um, simulation tool. So all you need is a web browser. You can use it from a laptop like I'm doing right now. You can use a tablet or, or really any, any old computer will, will work. Um, it's a full-fledged simulation product, and you know we have uh, multiple different sets of physics, but usually most people are doing either CFD or, or solid mechanics. Um, the, the great benefit here is that there's really just infinite computing capacity uh, thanks to the power of, of the cloud. So you know, a, a normal desktop CFD solution, you might, you're going to have to run your simulations one at a time. So if you're trying to do a parameter sweep and want to change, say, a boundary condition and, and change, okay, um, you know, maybe my, my airflow at this duct is um, a, a range of 10 different flow rates. Well, each one of those simulations on a traditional desktop computer would have to run one by one. So you would have to queue them. With SimScale, you can run you know, all 10 or as many as you want at, at once, and they all get dedicated hardware and, and will run at the same amount of time. Um, now, we also give you access to really massive computers that would cost an incredible amount of money. So uh, when running simulations uh, using SimScale, you can use up to 64, or I'm sorry, 96 cores at once, which we all know um, would be, you know, a computer in the tens of thousands of dollars uh, to own if, if you wanted to have an on-premise solution. And um, just just the hardware piece alone, you know, we are very competitively priced, considering that there's no additional investment for for hardware on your end. So again, we do structural mechanics, uh, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, um, and, and you know other other types of physics. We offer real time support by chat or phone and uh, and email. And I think we're definitely the only uh, um, simulation solution that has in in product chat. So uh, you could be using the tool, have a quick question, and you can just ping one of our application engineers. We're all notified. We have people pretty much working 24-7 uh, around the clock, and, and they can uh, help you out and, and get you the answers you need. Um, we also have a huge community. So the platform is actually free to, to use if, um, if, if you just want to use it for, you know, for fun or if you're curious about simulation. Um, there's a free version. So what that has done is generated a huge, huge public uh, database of, of projects that you can reference. So for instance, um, for instance, maybe you're a wind engineer or you know an architect who has mainly been you doing uh, wind simulations. Um, but now you know you get a project and you have to look at thermal comfort inside a, an auditorium. You can go find a public project, copy it to your own account and understand how it was set up. How was the meshing done? What types of boundary conditions were used? And so on. Um, this is extremely helpful because it, you know, you'll never, you're, there, you're always going to learn something by by poking around on the public projects. Um, now, again, it's it's very fast and easy to use. So you're just going to get, you know, I, I spend more time setting boundary conditions or post processing results than I do waiting for simulations to finish solving. Um, that is just no longer a, a problem. Um, whereas you know, at, at former jobs, you know, waiting solve time was a big issue. Um, we also have a high security uh, advanced encryption standard, um, and we're using AWS hardware, so it's a it's a very secure system. All right, so now to kind of jump into today's topic. So uh, I you know I wanted to. Uh, do a webinar basically on on Boston because it is where I work and I've I've lived for some time. So, you know, cities which which sit on the water, which a lot of them, almost most of them, do, um, can experience unusually high, you know, uh, discomfort due to wind. So, we've all you know walked down the street by the ocean and had sand blown in our face or you know lost our umbrella or something like that um, due to very very high. Wind speeds out on the ocean. There's there's really uh, nothing to slow the wind down, uh, no obstruction, so it comes shooting in off the ocean, and and is very uncomfortable. Uh, the event the now with wind coming into the city, the Venturi effect plays a huge role, which we'll kind of dive into in a moment. Um, it basically accelerates the the velocity of the wind, so you get you know like a tunnel effect going down city streets and things like that. 
So architects and building designers are increasingly considering pedestrian wind comfort during an initial design phase. Um, you know, whether that's changing a building location or just, uh, uh, you know, considering the, the orientation, which way it faces, um, in, in order to try to minimize uh, discomfort there. So just quickly touching on the, the venturi effect. It, it basically what happens is if you have a, a velocity at, at a mean, you know, uh, or if you have air at a mean velocity going into a constriction, the velocity is going to go is going to go up, and the pressure is going to decrease. So, what does this mean? Uh, f you know, for a city, basically, as you have wind shooting in off the ocean, uh, you know, the wind has to go or the air has to go somewhere, and it shoots down you know, alleyways, um, c city streets, and other areas where it can, um, and so you get even a, a faster speed. So just a bit of like an overview. This, this has actually been studied quite a bit by, by city planners and architects. Um, you know, there are quite a few negative outcomes for pedestrian wind comfort. So, uh, you know, parks can be built and then no one will hang out with, you know, uh, during their lunch or, or think something like that because it's so uncomfortable. Um, there could be personal injury. So if you have flying umbrellas or, or lawn chairs, shopping carts, things like that, um, they can hit people and, and it can be very dangerous. Um, shops in undesirable locations just, you know, may not be able to, to be rented out and, and so on. Um, and sometimes wind blocking is necessary. So where I actually used to work, uh, they in the winter they put up basically panels to, to keep people next to the building uh, more comfortable. And, and that's, you know, it's an expensive solution, and if one of those were to come loose, it'd be, it'd be dangerous. So, you know, wind speed, and, and it really has to be engineered here. So I want to spend a little time on this scale called the Beaufort Wind Scale. Uh, it's developed, and, uh, you know, a lot of wind engineers or, or um, uh, you know, sailors will, will know this scale. So it's, it generally goes from zero to around eight and it uh, kind of rates it. So uh, a couple columns in, you'll see basically a ground wind speed in, in meters per second, and then, of course, a, a description. Um, so when I went and found wind data for, for Boston, um, you know, we were looking at what, you know, Beaufort um, strength uh, it, was, it was rated at, and then uh, move forward from there. So first, I, I do want to touch on some kind of technical background, just because it's particularly applicable here. Um, so the simulation I'm going to show you is, is using the lattice Boltzmann method. This is a bit of a different type of, of simulation of CFD, and it has some huge advantages. It's a good fit for this type of application and, and has some large uh, advantages. So the first one really uh, is it's pretty much a, a meshless uh, solution. So on, on a model like this where you have thousands of buildings, there's going to be there's a high chance that a lot of the geometry is in pretty tough shape. So what that means, um, there might be interferences. You could have, uh, you know, intersecting edges or or even open edges, um, things like that. Now it's just it's not realistic to go through a model of say a thousand buildings and and make modifications to each one of them. So you can get a good mesh. Um, here, all you do is just bring in your your file format whether it's, uh, you know, STL, Parasolid, et cetera, and just hit the solve button. Um, it also is, is very uh, good at, at um, running transient simulations. So we can run simulations that are in the hundreds of seconds long, which is just not possible with a traditional CFD tool. Um, so those two fits are, are very good for today. The Boston example I'll show you, I actually ran for 200 seconds of transient analysis. Um, and it ran in less than an hour, um, solving um, on, on GPUs. Um, we actually, we will solve on up between one and up to 16 GPUs, and, um, and that actually accelerates the process uh, a lot compared to a traditional CPU uh, uh, setup. Again, so this is a different model than, than the Boston one, but I just wanted to point out um, Really tough geometry. Um, you know, you can see a few intersecting edges, and you can see a few interferences, and 
and you know this simulation works just fine. This image was actually taken inside the SimScale platform. It's um, you know runs with no no problem. So on on to my my case study for today. So here's a, a, a map of Boston, and I kind of will circle. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the city, uh, it'll look very you know, obvious. Um, and and kind of the top left is more of the downtown area, and then the center of the screen is, is called Seaport, um, which is part of Boston. Really, I, I just wanted to detect windy areas, particularly windy areas. I spend a lot of time in this region, so I thought it would be interesting. Um, some of these areas, you know, I have been in personally, and it's been very undesirable. So I said, "Hey, you know, walking to work, what effect? You know, maybe I could run a simulation on this area." Um, so again, uh, I boxed around the Seaport District, pointed out downtown, and then um, I kind of pointed to uh, Fort Point Channel, which is a little channel. Um, I basically a lot of people walk, uh, you know, across those three bridges every day to to work and back, and there's a lot of traffic there. So I thought. I, I know from experience there's a lot of wind that shoots down the channel. Maybe we can take a look at how uh, flow works around there. So here's another uh, image essentially of, of the same region. So there's that channel. Over on the right side would be more of the, the downtown area closer to, to South Station. Uh, the far left is, is Seaport and uh, those are those bridges and, and channel. So again, at, twice a day thousands of people, I'm, I'm one of them, walk um, basically from right to left and then back at the end of the day you know does it, you know can you observe the venturi effect here can you see velocity accelerating as you go down the the, the channels or the the streets that are uh, in this area i also just wanted to know what you know what the general wind profile looks like in this area so here's the CAD model. Uh, this is actually in SketchUp. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to be given this and, and given permission for to, to do a you know share publicly, and um, I ended up exporting as a STL format. So here's some data I actually got that was supplied by uh, Logan Airport. So uh, there's a lot of GIS data available online, um, and here is a just basically an average over a year of, of what the wind uh, wind speed and direction looks like from Logan. So uh, wind is actually always reported um, at, as the direction it's coming from. And here you can see a lot, you know, a lot of wind comes from west, northwest, and, and you can see a magnitude. So here basically if, you know, how to read this would just, um, would basically it would tell you that, you, you know, you get a Beaufort uh, scale six coming from west, west northwest um, about 13% of the year, which is quite high. Now, my simulation today, I actually did a, a wind direction of uh, west-southwest. Uh, again, you can see that's pretty common uh, for, for the Boston area. And um, a level 6 is, again, about that 10 to 14 meters per second, which is what I ended up using uh, for this model, a bit on the higher side. So the next step here is, is to develop a, uh, a realistic boundary condition at, at your inlet. Um, I'm essentially trying to make a, an atmospheric boundary layer here, um, and I had you know a, a couple reference points. So I assume that the 14 meters per second was collected at, at Logan Airport from 10 meters high, and I'm using an aerodynamic roughness of the ocean. Really, um, it's pretty much a, a book value, and I, I developed this curve. Um, it's logarithmic, um, and I just generated it from a spreadsheet. Now, so I'm going to actually enter this into uh, SimScale as a you know CF, a CSV uh, spreadsheet that's just a function of height versus velocity. And you can see after you know 500 meters, there's pretty much no change in, in velocity. Okay, so on the left is is my CAD inside of SimScale, and I kind of put some arrows to to just uh, show you the direction that the wind is coming at. Um, and again, this would be uh, west southwest and um, yeah, it's it's 22 degrees or 22 and a half uh, counterclockwise from from horizontal. Um, for boundary conditions, I, I basically have that atmospheric boundary layer on the inlet. The outlet, I'm just using a pressure boundary condition, and the the sides on either end and the top um, have a slip boundary condition. Uh, there's of course a, a no slip boundary condition on on all the terrain because um, we all know you know a fluid basically sticks to 
to a solid at the, at the interface. This was a 200 seconds of transient analysis. So it'd be you know, as if you're standing on a pier there just um, for, for you know, two minutes and change. Now, I, I said it's a, it's a meshless solution, you know, basically uh, compared to the, a traditional uh, CFD run. There is a, a voxel mesh here, um, and you, need a, you do need to add some refinement, but you're not going to get meshing errors like you would traditionally. Um, so here I, I'm basically doing a surface refinement. I just clicked and selected the STL surface. It's, it's all one surface, and I'm just putting a target resolution. So what that's just going to mean is the edge of a, uh, really the, the edge length of a single voxel, really, um, cube. Uh, two meters is, is quite small, considering this model is, you know, probably uh, over a kilometer in square area. So it's a pretty good resolution. I'm, I'm also particularly interested uh, in the flow between zero and eight meters in height. So I added a region. It's, this is really just a region refinement um, where between, you know, from the ground level up to eight meters, uh, there's a target resolution of, of two meters. That's where the majority of, of complex, uh, you know, highly turbulent flow is, is going to occur. Um, and, you know, up much higher, at, you know, way past the, the building height, we don't really care too much about what is going on there. So now we can take a look at and do a, do a result summary, really. So here's a video of, of the flow coming through this region. It's starting in the top right corner and is coming down um, parallel to the top left, kind of where the results trail off there. You can see it's out at the ocean, it's pretty much uniform, and as it comes in, it, you know, hits off of buildings and is, is highly turbulent. Uh, the channel up top has, uh, you know, fluctuating flow, so it's going from, you know, uh, 14 meters per second or a little higher down to, to seven, um, which is, you know, 100% uh, fluctuation. Um, just in the same location, it's just time dependent, which is pretty wild. So, you know, standing there hanging out on, on a bridge would, would be pretty undesirable. Um, over on the far right hand side, you can see, you know, the first bu uh, buildings right on the, the ocean uh, cause a, a ton of turbulence, especially in between um, the, the buildings where there's kind of those little channel areas. I pointed out some areas of, of you know, highly turbulent, unsteady flow. Uh, you know, the, the top left one there is a region where, again, you know, massive fluctuation, almost from, from no wind up to 14 meters per second and back down uh, within a 200 second, uh, you know, time interval. On, on the bottom, bottom middle, there's a region where you can see, uh, you know, vortices occurring um, and, you know, it'd be very uh, uncomfortable to hang out, you know, in front of the building. And, um, you know, if, if you were having lunch there or something, it would, uh, it would be quite undesirable. And again, you know, the general trend here is, okay, by the ocean, a lot of highly turbulent flow. The channel has, high, you know, highly turbulent, high velocity. The middle of the model here is actually quite quiet and, and really has, you know, very little flow going on. It's also worth mentioning uh, this area up here. Um, really takes the, the worst of the high velocity coming off the channel. So here we kind of have that view, um, sort of like a, a high view out from the ocean, and, and we're showing vectors here. So this is showing uh, direction. On the far left side, you can see, uh, you know, the vectors aren't moving because there's just no change in direction out, out on the water, really. Um, it, things only start to go crazy and, and change direction and, and become hectic um, as, as they go into the city. So on the far right side, you can see, you know, uh, velocity vectors bouncing all over the place, um, which means there's just, you know, direction is, is constantly moving. Um, you can see some, some flow shooting down into that main uh, street there. I, I think that's Summer Street. And, um, yeah, in this area, you can see uh, basically pulsating, uh, you know, flow between 14 and say five uh, meters per second. It's also kind of almost ironic. Um, this building is actually shaped almost like a like an airfoil. So flow is coming off the ocean 
hitting it and changing direction, um, <laughs> almost as if it, you know it was designed to do that. So I pointed out a, a couple higher, highly undesirable areas here. Yeah, you can see you can see it would not be comfortable to be hanging out there. So here's another view. This is really looking at, of course, a horizontal and a vertical cut plane. Um, you can see on the far left, the, the boundary layer really against the ground is very small because you're, you're right on the water. As you track towards the right, uh, you know, there's, there's more sort of a boundary layer uh, developing there. You have super low velocity down at the ground level um, or at the top of the buildings, and it's, you know, there's some vortex shedding occurring here coming off the, the top of the buildings. Again, just a lot of you know transient uh, flow right around the boundary layer at the top of those buildings, quite quite large fluctuations. So here's a, a top view, um, just a, with a bit of a different uh, texture on it. Um, some of the wild areas here are again in that. That airfoil shaped building, uh, you can see a, a vortex occurring at the right off the tail end of it, uh, occurring in between uh, the two buildings there. In the top left as well, we can see there's really some just large fluctuations. The, the far left arrow really is showing a region where high velocity in a, in a tight, tight spot between two buildings. Um, and as it trails off the back, um, you, you can see a, a nice vortex occurring. So it's you're really going to have a dead zone in in the middle of that vortex. Uh, we have, you know, um, just low velocity. You could have sand fill, you know, uh, piling up there. You could have snow piling up there. The middle arrow is that that airfoil shaped building I, I was pointing out, um, and the the far right arrow is is showing uh, flow down down the street there. You can sort of see pulsating flow coming out onto the main street, which I believe is Summer Street, and um, channeling, channeling in between the two buildings there. Awesome. Um, well, that's kind of a, a, a summary of the of the you know results there. Um, if there's any questions, chat into the, the chat bo box here, and we can, uh, we can answer your questions as they come in. Okay, I am getting a few questions here. So um, how long did, this, did the simulation take to run? So um, the, the simulation ran about, um, it was about an hour wait to, to get the finish there, and that's because I ran it for, for 200 seconds. So if I wanted to, to run it for 400 seconds or... or um, and so on, it would, you know, it would be longer, but a, a one hour wait for a simulation of that size is, uh, is quite nice. Um, the, the scaling, it, it, you know, the solver can use multiple GPUs, and that's automatically decided based on, on RAM consumption. So someone asked, uh, how many cells and how many cores uh, did it use? So this was around 20 million cells, which is fairly small for this type of application. Of course, it would be considered very large for a, um, a you know, a, a traditional CFD, but for Lattice Boltzmann, 20, 20 million is, is not bad at all. It only ran on one GPU because uh, it only need really memory from one GPU. So if I, you know, uh, really doubled doubled the mesh here, it would probably start, you know, paralyzing and, and using more GPUs. Um, but but for now, just one. And again, that, you know, that is not just a, a, a traditional core. This is a, a GPU. So someone asked, uh, what are some examples of reducing the, the high turbulence in a region? Um, typically, when, I, when I've spoken to, to really architects generally using this tool, uh, they'll change the orientation of the building. Um, so just, you know, how they place it and you know, which way does it face uh, can actually make a huge difference. Uh, whether you're just moving the, the entrance, um, entrance and exit of a building 
um, into a you know a less turbulent area um, to in order to you know make the exit a little better or just changing the building can actually change the, the you know macroscopic simulation results so maybe you know orienting the building a little differently means um, there there is no you know high high flow areas in that area So is fluid structural interaction useful for pedestrian wind comfort, or is just CFD necessary? Um, so I, I would say FSI is usually just uh, more for a wind loading scenario on the building. Uh, so this tool can be used for that as well. Um, but, but, you know, the answer you're trying to solve there is, is you know, what are the uh, you know, forces on the building, what are the pressure coefficients on the building, and, and so on. Um, for pedestrian wind comfort, uh, you know, really just looking at velocity is, is generally sufficient enough. All right, I still have some questions coming in here. Okay, so with, with regard to SimScale, can you carry out the simulations from beginning to end, um, really from geometry and all the way through meshing, solving, post-processing, or do you need to have the, the model ready before you run, use the system? Um, so as long as you have an SDL file, really, uh, you're, you're ready to go. So, um, you know, you're not going to build the geometry inside of the SimScale platform, but just upload it and then, and then you're ready to go. So the, the meshing is done. The meshing is completely automated for, um, for this type of analysis. It's, you know, it's integrated there. And then when you solve and run uh, the simulation, all your results are, are still in the browser. You can use the post processor and, and analyze results uh, while still, you know, in, in your browser.
So someone is asking uh, with with regards to SimScale platform, uh, will the lattice Boltzmann method be available on the free account? So uh, that method is um, not available on the free account. The reason for that is because it's uh, utilizing uh, you know a graphics a graphics processing unit, which is uh, much more computer much more computationally powerful than a, a traditional CPU. So there's there's a premium there, um, and it, it costs us quite a bit of money internally. So um, for this is for commercial uh, users, but if you're interested um, in you know using this, you should reach out to us, and we'd be happy to chat. Awesome. I, I think I answered all the questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. If you have any other questions, just uh, please email us at support at simscale.com. Um, you know, keep keep track of what we're up to, what we're doing, and and you know, feel free to reach out if you have any uh, questions or comments.